years. Uh, before that, a million startups. Uh, so it's been super exciting work. Um, so uh, Timani's team is working on, I'm sure that he'll tell us all about it, but uh, tools for um, uh, human computer interaction. Uh, and one of the tools, the first tool that went out of the team, editor, um, editor XR is the name, uh, just got a, um, an award. Uh, for, uh, this is a tool for directly um, editing uh, uh, content in VR. So um, in the uh, Unity, Unity side of VR. So welcome and uh, yeah, looking forward to your stuff. Cool, thank you. Hi everybody, thanks, thanks for being here today. Um, before I get started, I just want to do a little show of hands so I know what, what folks are working on. How many people are studying computer science in the room? Okay, so most people. Um, how many people are doing something that is not computer science? A couple, okay. Can you just like give a shout out if you raise your hand, what, what you're working on? Uh, I'm a design graduate student, but I'm working with VR capstone and animation, cool. computer animation. Okay. So. Cool. How about you? I'm an undergraduate interaction designer, also working on a senior project in XR. Nice. Um, I work for an XR company doing UX, CX for Cool. Yeah. I do what Phil does. Oh, I do what Phil does. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, and how many people have heard of Unity before or have used Unity in some capacity? Wow, okay, everyone, great. I don't actually talk about Unity all that much, so which is good because you already know it, so, okay. Um, this is what we will be going over today. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about Labs, um, the team at Unity. We do XR research, um, by which I mean augmented virtual reality, mixed reality, or spatial computing. You pick which one you want. Um, and then we'll talk about what I mean when I say spatial computing um, and why that's important. A little segue into why computers are so awesome. I think you guys are a pretty easy crowd though because most of you work on computers or with computers. Um, and then kind of going down the line to how computers will have to be in the future, how we interact with them today, and, and best practices for thinking about how humans should work with computers in, in the future when spatial computing fortunately, hopefully, takes off and becomes ubiquitous. Uh, in other words, we'll have to, we're going to talk about what we need to think about and what we're going to need to work with in order to get to the future, a really good future. Um, I, I don't talk about this too much. This is what uh, Unity looks like today. I think, <laughs> since everyone knows, I don't have to go over this in detail, but I think the, the one thing we can all take away from what Unity looks like today is that it looks very complicated. And if this is the first time that you've downloaded it or tried to use it, it can be incredibly daunting. And this is a funny quirk of working in 3D today because there is, humans can't really work with computers in 3D. We have to work with them in 2D. They are just little windows into the digital realm. And so it's cool that we live at a time now when hardware is getting to a point where we can actually move away from interacting with this three-dimensional world uh, with a pane of glass in between us into actually stepping into that world or having the digital world come back into uh, our own spaces with us, with uh, augmented reality. And I think people, don't, people think AR is cool and people think virtual reality is cool, but we don't often stop to think about what makes it so extra special. And that to me is the key, that there's always been this digital world here, we've just never been able to uh, walk into it. Um, oh, okay. So this is uh, just a little sizzle reel. This would be a good time for sound. Can we have sound, or is it no sound? I can just go like da na da 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 da. OK, this is just a quick, it, it's fine, it's fine. It's literally just like, it's just jazzy music. Okay. So this is Editor XR. Are you going to have more sound? Uh, it's okay, I can always just make it up. Um, so Editor XR, as mentioned earlier, I will talk about this briefly, is an open source extension under the um, MIT X11 license that allows you to be in Unity in the scene view and actually go in and make edits, uh, make annotations, move things in the space. Um, the cool thing about this is everyone wants this and everyone thought this was a great idea and something we should totally do. The bad part is it's really hard to use. I will talk about why. Um, carte Blanche, this is a concept uh, game making application. It turns out when you constrain people to very specific rules around how they can place objects, they do a much better job. It's kind of the Lego conundrum all over again. Uh, Animate VR, we were exploring how you could use uh, motion trails, how you could use AR as a window into virtual reality. This one's pretty cool. There's been some uh, consumer grade versions on the market. 
Then we have other teams that are working on more in-depth research around graphics. For example, um, human fidelity in, on, in Unity, real time, that's, that's no small feat. We have people who are just pushing graphics rendering across the board. This is our team in Grenoble. Um, they do a lot of work, won a paper, or won a prize at Seagraph last year, I believe. Pretty reflections. Um, we do artificial intelligence research. Right now, we're focused on improving non-player characters. So you have not just animation loops, but characters that have some amount of autonomy. Um, and then, of course, we're always thinking about why are we building the tools we're building? What's the goal? So we do concept work around what we think that future could potentially look like. Um, ha have any of you seen that full video, the business card video, before? Yeah, OK. I can, I can show people afterwards. So. One cool thing about this is when you start thinking about the medium in terms of what we'll see with the, the glasses, you realize all of the tools can also be that. And there's no reason you can just directly be authoring against the real object in the real world. So this is all shot through an iPhone, by the way. It looks much cooler than the reality of it. But the idea was to think about, OK, if you're in Unity and you know what you want to do, how can you do it better with glasses on? OK, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about Editor XR um, and some of the weirdness around it. Has anyone actually downloaded and tried Editor XR? A couple people? OK. How many of you have used um, a virtual reality creation tool like Tiltbrush or Tavori or Gravity Sketch or quite a few of you? OK. Um, did you feel like you could get to good? Do you feel like there, it was surprising when you used it? Or did you feel like it, you could instantly do what you wanted to do? Does anyone have a? Felt, it felt okay? I mean, you know, for creating kind of organic surfaces or like, you know, a stone kind of, you know, yeah. cabin or something like that that didn't have to be super precise, yeah. It was right. But it's hard to get to precision, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's one interesting thing about the tools that we have today. They are designed to be precise down to like 10 digits, right? Which is an interesting difference between what we sort of expect out of these natural interfaces and what we can actually get out of a computer. Um, yeah. A lot of the things that are on this screen are not simple or intuitive or obvious at all. The way you use the gizmo, the fact that you have to use shortcut keys in order to switch between camera views or to switch between panning versus driving the camera around. And yet we learn all of them because we have to tell the computer what we want the computer to do constantly. And we're pretty used to being able to do that in 2D. But it's weird because when you get into virtual reality, people start thinking that the computer should be able to read your mind and just know what you want to do next. And this ended up being the biggest challenge when we were trying to make really professional grade tools for virtual reality. The reality is that the computer still has no idea if you meant multi-select or single select. And you still have to go through some sort of hotkey or UI change or voice change or something to tell the computer what you want to actually do. Um, so object selection, for example. Object selection seems like the simplest thing in virtual reality. In theory, I should just be able to pick up this cup, and now this cup is selected. Um, in different types of games or experiences, you can have it highlight to show that it's selected or it's selectable. Um, you can change the controller model. You can do a lot of different things to kind of let the user know what you, what you can do with it. Um, these are all different options that I have seen in virtual reality before. I think it really depends on the type of experience you're making. But the funny thing is, too, when we're making Editor XR, we could have done any of these things, and there's no paradigm in place about which is the best for a professional grade tool. Um, when it comes to professional tools, they tend to be a lot uglier because they are a lot more customizable and a lot more stuff is exposed at the top level than in um, consumer grade tools. And this is because everyone has their own workflows. They get, they get uh, the flow into muscle memory and they go from there. So trying to extrapolate out those types of workflows and put them into virtual reality was much more difficult than we had expected. <laughs> okay, so this is a scene from uh, uh, I think the third Star Wars movie. How many of you have seen the third? Not like the sixth, but the third. Do you know what I'm talking about? OK, right. All right. This is just an example of what I mean when the computer does not can't read your mind and, and, and doesn't know what you uh, think. This specifically refers to ray casting or object selection at a distance, which is why I skipped that slide, because I think I just want to show you all. Um, this comes up a lot later when we're going to talk about different types of modalities, especially visual ones. So keep this in mind for them. When, uh, People watch Harry Potter or they watch Star Wars. There is already, ironically, this kind of visual language in place around how you think you can select objects at a distance. Um, and you can try to emulate it in virtual reality. And sometimes it feels really good. So for example, I, I can look at an object and double click and have it 
come to me. That feels great. But if I wanted to do anything else with it, the further away it is, the less precise I am. And also, if I wanted to do something else with it, then have it come to me, then we don't know what's going to go on. I'm just going to play this video and talk through what you'd actually need to tell the computer in order to get this to work. So here we have the emperor single selecting different seats, <laughs> floating on top of one, but he's going to be like, select one, select one, and they come crashing down. And then he's going to go into multi-select mode. OK, here he is in single select, right? One, one, one. And then I think now he's going to go into multi-select mode. Oh, no, nope, just one again, sorry. But now Yoda stops it, and Yoda goes into pause mode, and now Yoda is going to go into rotate mode. <laughs> <laughs> and now Yoda is going to throw it back at him. And for some reason, this is too fast, and, and you can't handle it. OK. Now, none of these things were things that were said. A lot of them were gestural. And we can kind of approximate this pretty well today if you have a leap motion or if you have another type of, of uh, hand tracking solution. I think it was earlier on, though, that we used the same gesture to perform the same action. Actually, I have a better example of this happening. This one's from Chronicle, which is, frankly, a super awesome film. How many people have seen Chronicle? Like kind of under the radar, right? Really good, great movie. OK, so these kids all have telekinesis. And you see this guy. Wait, what's happening here? Oh, right, OK, yes. I think this is kind of cropped. I'm sorry. Anyway, so this guy just comes out, and he's basically using the same gesture over and over to destroy everything. Can you actually see his face? No? OK. Huh, I'm sorry, that was cropped and weird, so I'm just going to literally do it for you. He was like, pow, pow. And some people got knocked over, and some people got pushed out of the way. And then he used a pow again, and the door opened, and he used another pow gesture, and money jumped into the bag. So this is an example of something that looks like it should really work, and the, the computer has to be reading your mind in order to actually be able to do it correctly, um, but wouldn't actually make sense for virtual reality. The point here is, and I might be just ramming this into the ground a little bit much, you need to be able to tell the computer what it is you want to do next, and you can't use repeatable gestures for all of this. All right. Um, so telekinesis is not exactly impossible, or the concept of it, or however we've thought about it. Um, but just get ready to start using a bunch of tutorials to describe to people what they're doing at the time. Um, one thing that we're doing for Editor XR is just letting you move objects uh, on a mini on a miniature board uh, as if they were close to you, so we can kind of just work around the entire issue. All right, here's an example of. Uh, I'm sorry, my slides are a little bit out of order, so I'm trying to uh, get it, get up to speed with where I am in the slide deck. Um, OK, so let's just talk about this. This is an Editor XR. We have a scene laid out. Um, in an Editor XR, you don't have physics or gravity. And most of the time, you actually don't want physics or gravity because you want to be able to put your clouds in the sky. And you want to be able to move objects uh, you know, to, to weird spaces and so on. But you do often want to snap things to the surface like you do in physics. Like if I put this cup on the edge of this table, it's you know, still basically snapping in a way. Um, so the question is, how do we know when you want to snap physics style versus how, when you want to actually just have objects aligned, et cetera, et cetera? So we ended up coming up with like a bazillion different ways for people to do snapping and object placement in Editor XR so you could put things exactly where you wanted in a way that still felt relatively good. So here, for example, we have snapping to ground. Um, and we also have some visualizations here so you can see at what point it snaps on and off from the surface to the other surface. That was a big one. You can also directly select the object, and then you can kind of have it snap and sort of move along the ground. And we don't limit the uh, rotation point here. Go into the main menu. And then we're going to have it snap. This is the whole snapping interface. And now we do have rotate objects turned on. So now we can have it snap or uh, rotate to match the angle of the, the face of the other surface. And this seems pretty intuitive, too, but it actually became a big question. Like, if I have the cup on the edge of the, the, um, the desk here, does it go like this when it comes, gets to the edge, or does it snap like this? And depending on where you want to put it, you have to be able to do what you want. 
Again, another problem with professional tools for uh, virtual reality, it seemed a lot easier in our heads when we were first starting off, but then realizing that we had to let developers do whatever they wanted to do meant we had to add in a lot of options that people weren't expecting. Anyway, Editor XR, uh, you can download it today on GitHub for free. You can use it, you can, uh, you can amend it, you can blow everything about it away. You can use it in runtime as well. So we have a bunch of selection tools, locomotion tools, transform tools, annotation tools, and you can actually use them in your own application. I definitely recommend it. Uh, but I'm not just here to talk about XR. That, that was just the basics and background of the th types of things we're working on in labs. Um, now we're going to talk about spatial computing, which has been the focus of my team for the last year and a half. So what do I mean when I said spatial computing? Also, maybe you're saying, I thought you did virtual reality if you've seen my stuff over the earth, seen what we've been working on over the last couple of years. Um, by spatial computing, actually, show of hands, how many people have an idea about what you think spatial computing means? One, two, three, four, OK, a few, all right. You might profoundly disagree with what I'm about to say, and that is totally fine. I actually don't care that much as long as we're all on the same page, which is why I'm talking about this with you today. Uh, you can call it natural computing or ambient computing. Um, I don't know how to say that. Anthropocentric computing? Holograms or augmented or mixed reality. I think all of these different words are some subset of, of what I'm trying to get to. Um, I think most of the time, though, and this is a key, most of the time in people's heads they have the same vision or a similar vision of what they think the ideal is. Um, and right now most of our best examples come from concepts like movies, like the examples that I just showed you, of different ways you in theory can move around objects with your head. Um, sometimes they make sense and they're good. I like this little gesture where he's just kind of flipping things out of the way and, and knows what to do. Um, I was just kind of making fun of this earlier with the Star Wars example, but I do believe there is space for, um, for computers to calibrate to the humans so they would just know to do that over time. And we'll get into more, more into that in a bit. Um, but sometimes examples are just really terrible. I mean, I really love this movie, but the, the worst possible way to answer a phone call is to have to go like this with someone else and maintain that state for like, what, the next 30 seconds? That's no boy now. Uh, also, when it comes to augmented reality specifically, people like to go full on dystopian. Like, what if we lived in the future when everything was beamed into your eyeballs all the time? Oh my god. Um, have, have anybody seen this video before? This is hyper. Okay. The thing about this video, and I think some other examples from Black Mirror, is that often the dystopians that they're presenting have nothing to do with the medium itself and everything to do with tying together digital capital and social capital which is another conversation that I'm happy to have over drinks. But I do think it's interesting that people sort of assume that once computers live all around you and are following you, that it intrinsically follows that what you do in the digital realm should have significant financial or commercial ramifications in the real world. I disagree with this. I don't think it has to be the case. But a lot of the dystopian examples do tend to have that. I mean, nobody wants this, right? I mean, maybe somebody wants this, and they can have this. But we don't all have to have this. Instead, I think most of us just want like Minecraft or in our living room, something like that, right? This is nice. This is cool. People are actually building this today. Um, so I, I gave part of this talk at GDC earlier this year. And as I was going through and trying to find examples of what I thought was good spatial computing, I realized that I couldn't find any that I really liked. So instead, I chose to come up with a really crappy version of my own. <laughs> I actually just drew on photos of my bedroom, and I want to walk you through my example of a great spatial computing morning. <laughs> and the point of this really is, again, I don't care what, what you call it in the future. I just want to talk about, ideally, if we nail it, if we get it right, if we get devices talking to each other, if we get persistent computing sessions across devices on the cloud, get personalization right, and get privacy right, what does that mean in 10 to 15 years? What does it look like in the morning? OK, so I wake up in the morning every day, and this is my view. I wake up at 6.30, and then I think to myself, why am I, why am I awake right now when I go back to sleep? <laughs> I look downstairs. <laughs> this is something I actually do today. I have the hue lights turn on every morning to help me wake up. Uh, so there they are. This is actually, you know, like spatial computing is here. Um, but in the future, I'll be able to tell my alarm 15 more minutes, which is something it can't do today. By the way, Siri ignores you if you try to talk to it over the alarm. Um, 
I say to my computer, 15 more minutes, it gives me a quick confirmation beep, not a visual, nothing else, and tells me to shut up, oh, or, and, and turns off the lights. By the way, uh, I would say here, I try to be fairly agnostic about what types of devices were used. So for almost any given visual you see, it could be a headset, it could be projection mapping, it could be a screen, it could be whatever. The point isn't so much to talk about how we're going to use the technology of today in the future, it's about what kind of future do we want and then how do we build around it. So in this case, I'm just, I don't need any audio. I'm maybe not even wearing glasses. Why would I wear them to bed? Um, maybe I have a brain implant, who knows? But in any case, I'm going back to sleep. So <laughs> half an hour later, I wake up for real. And usually the first thing that I want to know in the morning is basically how long do I have before I need to be wherever I need to be? I don't really need to know much more than that. So I have a custom interface that I've designed left, or I've designed myself that says I have three hours left. Um, I myself have chosen for it to tell me what my next meetings are in the office so I can prepare if I want to. But the number one thing that I want to start doing in the morning is stretching every morning and doing a meditation. So I have set a big note to myself that says to stretch. Now again, this could be, I guess, on my phone. I can't actually make this type of interface on my phone today. It could be uh, glasses. It could be projection mapping on like a clear glass screen over there. Whatever it is, that's, that's the point. And by the way, notice that the lights are turned off now. Um, you did it in part because I turned off the alarm, but also because the, the lights know not to come on after sunrise, which is, again, something that actually exists today. You can tell hue lights to turn on when your alarm goes off, unless it, the sun has already risen, which is pretty cool. Um, so I lay out my yoga mat so I can do my stretch. And so over here in the corner, almost unnoticeable, is this little volume controller. And all this does is let me hit play or pause or change the volume. Um, I just pin it to the yoga mat. And the way we could pin this, if it's glasses, it could be just something that knows it's anchored in space here, like a magic leap. Um, it could be a little camera that's shooting down in a short throw projector. It, it doesn't matter what the device is. The point is it's a very minimal interface. I don't need a whole thing in front of my face. I just need this little thing anchored there. So if I need to pause, I can pause. Um, and also if I look down, I have a Sonos down here. Um, so if I look at the Sonos and I have gaze tracking or eye tracking, or it just generally knows when I'm in the area, I say turn the volume up. It has to turn the volume up. And it also gives me a quick indication of where the volume was and where the volume went to, and then it fades away. And this is important. This is something that is really missing from today's um, home assistants because you can say turn volume up, but you don't know where the volume is at this point, and you don't know what the increment level is. It actually kind of drives me nuts. And then over here, I have my coffee maker downstairs. So if I look down there, by the way, I'm very lazy. I'm just like looking at things. I'm not actually going downstairs yet. <laughs> <laughs> I look at my coffee maker, and it says it started up, and I have two minutes left. I can set the alarm now. Um, it's not on my coffee maker like today. But I can't actually have it uh, tied to my alarm to go off after my alarm goes off. So that's a dream I have for the future. I want it, if I sleep in, I want it to wait before it actually starts up again. But here, I don't need to know anything else about uh, my coffee other than how long it is till it's done. Don't tell me when it was started, um, because then I just have to do the math in my head about when it's going to be finished. Um, I just want to know when I can drink it. And if I want to pause it, maybe I can say pause, something like that. Um, and here I want to digress for just a moment into something that I absolutely do not want to see in this wonderful spatial computing future that we're all going to live in. I don't want to see shit like this. I do not want to see options to buy more things. I do not want to see those cool little sensors, even though they have been on every sci-fi interface since 1962. They look really cool. What does it mean? I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> I don't need to know the fullness level. I don't need to know any of this stuff. And when it comes to movie interfaces, I'm going to ding them hard because they all pretty much look like this. I mean, I made this, you know, in like half an hour. It's easy to do, and it gets, it looks really cool. But this is not what I want to see every morning when I look at my coffee, and it's not what you want to see, and this is what leads to bad design and what leads to people thinking that they don't actually want augmented reality or spatial computing because of stuff like this. When you're drinking coffee, there are only two things that you need to know. When can I drink it? And are you sure it's not decaf, right? Those are the two things. 
All right, back to my day. I go and I take a shower. Um, here, there's no interface at all, other than I have an Alexa-enabled Sonos over here. I know some people are creeped out by that, by the way. Um, you can turn it off if you want to. I don't turn mine off because I'm lazy, and I also don't believe they're actually going to do anything that interesting with my data. But I did find out that a lot of my friends are really creeped out having Alexas in the bathroom. So uh, if you ever visit my house for a party or something, just turn the button off at the top, <laughs> FYI. In theory, I could also have visuals here if I wanted to, or I could use voice. Obviously, I can use voice today, um, but I don't need it, so I don't have it. However, I do have it in the shower. I know some people are going to think this is like kind of creepy or dystopian as well, to be like, oh, you have a computer in your shower? Like, Take a break from the digital world. OK. <laughs> I get it. I do get that. But when I'm in the shower, I have a lot of good ideas. I'm also thinking about a lot of things. And then maybe like I also want to just like change, you know, Spotify to be playing other music. So I, I don't need like a big interface here. All I really want is something waterproof where I can be like, hey Siri, write this down, or you know, check an email if I need to, or tweet, or just some, something kind of light, something maybe that's touch-based, just something that I can sort of use as like a digital scratch paper, and and, and there I've got it. Um, the one thing that I do not want to be able to do from here is change the temperature of the water. I do not want to have any of the base functionality of any of my digital goods to be tied to a digital interface. Do not want to have to wait for my firmware to update before I can take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> that is the point. Um, I think you can always have an additional digital, ugh, an additional digital interface and have that work really well. You can always, you know, maybe you could tell me the temperature. I actually don't know what temperature I like to take a shower at because I, I don't have that information. But when it comes to digital interfaces overlying perfectly good mechanical devices that we have known and used forever, don't mess with success. Add on to them, but don't certainly don't take away the base functionality if it already works. Straight up. OK, so after I go uh, take a shower, I go to my vanity here. And this is where I put on my makeup. And my curling iron and straightener are already turned on because this is my morning. And I can have whatever I want to have happen. Yay. <laughs> uh, here's my desk. This is what it actually looks like today. Uh, and then here it is in the future. And I'm just going to walk you through again. Uh, uh, actually, we're going to go right to left on this one. Um, so here's just another example of that stop and like volume up and down interface. So you, you remember it was pinned to the yoga mat. I want basically the same interface also pinned to my desk when I get over here. Um, here is kind of like, I don't know, probably a browser. Maybe it's like Slack or maybe it's you know messages or something. Just something that I can quickly scroll through. I do want to make a point here. Um, this is all probably going to be a touch base interface. I don't have any customized peripherals. I don't have a pen, and I don't have a keyboard. If I wanted to do any kind of real work, which involves me inputting a lot of information or outputting, I would probably want those. But right now, that's not the focus. The, fo the focus is more that I'm getting ready. And so having a simple uh, touch screen interface is totally fine. Up here, I don't know, I have a funny GIF or something. And over here, I have something that doesn't exist, but I really want to have exist, which is just a kind of um, paste bin slash to-do list slash what have you. I think this is going to be increasingly important with spatial computing, because I want to be able to take anything from here and put it in here, anything from here and put it in here. It's kind of like a, what did Harry Potter have? He had like a bag where he could put as much stuff in as he wanted. You know what I'm talking about? It's like infinitely large. I need that. What? No. <laughs> Come on. I know someone knows what it is. Um, yeah, so something like this is just sort of a digital grab bag, because this is kind of a spatial thing you take with you, right? Like, oh, yeah, I want to take this with me. And I want to take this with me. And then later on, you can go through and sort it all out. So I guess one, this is a really interesting vision. So part of it is that information is like anchored to place. Not necessarily. We can talk about it. Uh, I, I go into depth on this more later, but go ahead. I guess, so right now we're used to having it all in our pocket, right? We can, we can access whatever, any of our apps anywhere we want. Mm -hmm. Here it seems more like you know you go to your desk for certain functionality, and you, you know you go to whatever coffee maker for other functionality, which makes sense to some extent. I'm just wondering how easy it will be to partition. Um, yeah. 
hard. Uh, yes, I actually like one of the whole sections is entirely about different types of permission sets. But actually, I'll just I'll just talk about it right now because why not? This is a subset of another app, right? This is a music player, and it could be let's call it, I'll just say Spotify because I use Spotify and that's easy. Um, this is an approximation of an entire OS. So this is a container layer that could be switched between multiple apps. This is only one app. Okay. Um, this is, you know, another display layer. This is, I think, I'm thinking of this as the equivalent of a prism on a Magic Leap device. How, how many of you are familiar with Magic Leap's landscape OS? Some of you? Okay, so just so you know, Magic Leap has two types of apps. Uh, it has takeover apps that take over the entire computer, and now you're in a robot shooting game, for example. And then it also has something called the landscape, in which you can have multiple concurrently running apps, each of which are contained in a bounding volume called a prism. So I'm thinking of this as being more like that, like a very small sort of just always on kind of, kind of thing. And this is an OS level interface. In order for all of this to work, we need a couple of things. First, we need the ability for the user to be able to customize each particular uh, permutation spatially of all of these different apps running, right? Um, and then also we need to be able to have the user have a persistent system or session, a computing session, running at all times regardless of where they are and what device they're using. I mean, that's really the grand vision. I think, uh, how many of you have heard the news about Google Stadia that came out recently? Some of you, okay. Most of you, great. So the cool thing about Stadia is that it actually has your, your game uh, session running in the cloud, and all it does is render down a frame to a device. The device could be an iPad, the device could be um, a computer, or whatever. But you're just rendering down frames. All of the big work is, is happening up above. In order to have persistent uh, computing sessions that could actually play out here on any given type of device, or play out near the yoga mat, or play out down where the coffee maker is, I, I, it could be a headset, could all be a headset, but some of it could be a headset, some could, some could be a real display, some could be um, computer mapping. We're going to need to move more towards a world where compute is not happening locally, except for edge slash, um, like say machine learning or encryption stuff, and most of the heavy work is actually happening somewhere else. So that way, this app can be running here, but then when I open up a random computer and it recognizes my face, it instantly switches and starts running in the frames on this computer instead. Is everyone following me here? Got it? OK, great. Did you have a question? Yes, yeah, sort of. Uh, I was just sort of imagining the situation of just waking up, hearing the alarm, and saying five more minutes or something and having it stop. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned something like putting on glasses or whatever, but if I'm like face down in my pillow trying to knock myself unconscious again, I don't want to get up out of my bed to put on glasses to select something and then plop down back. Yeah, no, voice, voice. That's why I went with voice. I don't want to do that shit either. <laughs> so, I don't know, I guess I'm just saying, like, you mentioned the combination of, like, voice and augmented gear or whatever. Do you think there's a possible future where it's, like, in the hypothetical where everything is just voice or, like? No. I want to skip ahead, actually. Um, and talk about why I don't think that's true. Because I think everything you guys are asking is, uh, is more akin to this section. OK. OK, uh, I'm going to go back in a second, but I'll start with this. So you said, do, you, do I see a future where I think we can communicate with computers via voice? Um, I think that voice is, well, I know that there are basically three ways that humans can interact with computers today. That th these are the big three. These are three of your five senses. The other two, taste and uh, smell, you really probably don't want to interact with a computer like that <laughs> or have it interact with you like that, maybe. I don't know. All right, so we got voice and then we got taste. <laughs> Um, so you have visual, which is good for certain things, auditory and physical. Visual is good for poses, gestures, graphics, text, UI screens, animations. This is actually the bulk of the way computers interact with humans today, is visually. Especially if, you, uh, like if you're talking about phones or tablets, right? Um, auditory, music, tone, sound effects, and voice, natural language processing, we're going to get into that. Um, this is uh, a way that humans 
interact with each other constantly. It's kind of noisy, I would say. Oh, it's noisy. That's a, not a joke. That's a silly joke if I had made that joke. But it's not supposed to be a joke. But it kind of is. It's noisy. It's noisy in that it's noise. But it's also noisy in that it is just full of uh, crappy data. Like the sentences that I just said, if you read them as, as a transcription, the actual value of, of, of the meaning is probably 10% of the words I just said. And then physical hardware buttons, haptics, and then uh, real objects, obviously, are, are physical things. And when I say modalities, I specifically mean uh, sensor input and output. Uh, we're also going to go over affordances and puts and feedback in feedback a little bit later. But modalities, just to be clear, when I talk about it, that's, these are the big ones that I'm going to be covering. Um, there are also some new passive inputs that are coming online right now because we are dealing with computers that have a lot more sensors than they used to have. Cameras are increasingly important or visible. Um, geolocation information, obviously. But now we can do crazy things like if we're tracking our eyes, we can get your heartbeat from the nerves, from the nerve movement. And we can also do things like track unconscious limb movement, which is pretty cool. And then later on, actually, I just started thinking about some new stuff, which you probably have been thinking about for a while, but we can talk about the implications in a second. OK, but I'm going to talk about the big three. And this, I hope, will answer your question about why I don't think uh, uh, voice is going to be the only thing. So visual, uh, visual modalities are, like I said earlier, the most common way a computer talks to humans today. Uh, obviously, disability is aside. Um, cool things about it are that it is extremely customizable. Even with words per minute, you can have an image that actually has many more words associated with it. So it can be even faster. Um, it can be instantly recognizable once you've learned it, which and you can learn it very quickly. Um, and it's also, in some ways, very high fidelity compared to sound or haptics. You can have a lot of dense information in a single image that you would have to you know, explain with words over the course of several minutes, for example. Um, but cons are, uh, how many of you have played a virtual reality experience where you kind of looked around for a while and like, didn't see the thing you were supposed to see? For, and yes, everyone. <laughs> yes. It's like the first lesson of virtual reality. People never look where you expect. Um, gestures are input. Hand tracking is input. Or, sorry, is visual input. People don't think about it like that. They usually think about it as physical input. And it can be if you're physically pressing something. But if I'm using a, a Magic Leap, or if I'm using a Leap Motion, or if I'm using a HoloLens, the way I'm actually um, communicating with the computer is visually. It is tracking my hands. Um, occlusion and overlapping, it's very big. It gets in the way. Um, if you're in the flow and you're doing something and a big like, visual display comes up, it's more likely to bother you than any other type of, phys or any other type of modality. Um, and also, if you want to do it really well, uh, it's pretty processing intensive. Actually, that's true of, of voice as well, but especially of eyes. So visual modalities are best for good, and clear, and obvious instructions. If you want to explain to some, someone how to do something, visual is fantastic for that. Um, it's great for tutorials and onboarding. Uh, I have an example of that later. And it's good for reading human pose, obviously, getting a sense of what the human is trying to do when. And so, uh, earlier when I was walking through my great special computing morning, you'll notice that I used it when I needed to know context about something, like when, where the, the uh, visuals were going from here to here, uh, when I was definitely looking at something and I just wanted confirmation, or when I wasn't super preoccupied with other tasks, I wasn't exactly in flow and I just kind of wanted to look at stuff and do it. Um, when I wanted to input a lot of data very quickly. Um, and here's an example of uh, use it used today. Like a typical smartphone phone is, is super visual, right? Um, it works even if the sound is off. It works with physical feedback, it even if there is no physical feedback. And animations have become increasingly important as computers have gotten more visual heavy to show you that what you just did worked. So they're being used as part of that feedback loop. And I mentioned already that hand tracking is uh, a visual input for the computer. There we go. OK. But I just, just, to, just to hone in the point to show you that that's, the computer is not tracking your hand and being like, ah, you want to pick up a cup. You're picking up a cup. The computer is sitting there looking at the, the pose of the skeleton of your bones or whatever, different version, landmark system, or et cetera. And that is how it is you are communicating with the computer in that moment. And that's also true of body tracking as well. 
How many of you are doing work uh, around uh, like body tracking or hand tracking for input types? No? OK. <laughs> I know you watch all this GIF. That's pretty amazing. OK, all right. Audio modalities. Um, pretty fast, not as fast as visual, right? Um, but if you, especially if you are disabled, like blind people will often uh, increase the speed of text on, on things they listen to, like podcasts and audiobooks, so you can get better at it. One cool thing about it, unlike visuals, which are easy to miss, uh, sound is omnidirectional, so it's very hard to miss. If I'm shouting at you across the room, it doesn't matter where you're looking or even necessarily where you are in the room. If the sound hits your ear, you'll get it. Um, it's easy. It's easily diegetic, by which I mean it's easy for me to have you know the sound of this cup landing on this table and credence and and, and help with world building. Do you, does everyone know what diegetic means? No. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if I actually know what the word means means, but in terms of uh, at least gameplay, diegetic UIs are UIs that actually fit into the world space. So for example, if you're playing uh, World of Warcraft, you'll have like kind of this two-dimensional UI that goes over on top of the world space. But if you're playing Grand Theft Auto and you're listening to the radio, it looks like a real radio in the world and you can actually change the radio itself. So the radio is diegetic. Um, the UI overlay is not diegetic. And it can be really subtle and still work really well. You can have your phone um, almost on silent. And if you've got a text message and you hear your little text message noise, you will, you will hear it and you will know what it is. Cons, um, people turn in off sound all the time on their devices. So you can have some of the best sound effects or, or, uh, or you know, soundtracks, and people will never never hear them. And even if they do, you don't know how they're going to listen to them. So it could be on headphones that are really crappy. It could be a full surround sound speaker system. You have very little control over this. And unlike other types of uh, functionality, or sorry, uh, other types of modality, like if I, if I watch something on a phone versus on a big screen, I'll get more out of it. I will get much less out of it if I have the sound turned off almost entirely if we're talking about diegetic sound types. Um, it's time-based, uh, it, like it only persists for so long, so if you miss it, you've got to keep repeating it, unlike a visual interface, which can be static. Um, slow across the board, and extremely vague as, as actual input, and this is what I was trying to get across a little bit earlier. When I talk to another human, uh, it is full of, and even when I, if you were listening to a transcript of this talk, the, the, it is so full of rubbish. And this has been a huge part of the problem with natural language processing. Like the computer doesn't know exactly what it's important. And this is actually why we've been focusing on wake words or specific nouns and just listening for the key word that infers intent because everything around it really doesn't mean that much. So when it comes to having uh, um, voice only inputs, it's gonna be a lot slower. You're gonna have to train up the computer a lot more. And you're going to have to train the computer constantly about what you don't want them to be paying attention to, because a lot of what you say doesn't mean anything. It's a funny thing about, I don't know, human, human to human interaction. We kind of know what to pay attention to or not from years of practice. So if you want to have your computer listen to you for the next 12 years, then we'll understand to ignore you sometimes. But that will take a while. Um, one interesting side note about audio that I haven't heard talked about much. Um, Audio was used as early as the um, turn of the century of the, the 19th, or sorry, 20th century uh, in a play. The, I think one of the first known use cases was to emulate a baby crying off stage using a record in like 1910 or something like that. So it was used really early on for sound effects. And apparently audiences were fooled back then and thought it was a real baby. In the same way, you know, when they saw the, the train rushing towards them in the theater, they thought it was a real train and they were scared. The interesting thing is that we know now that no one would be fooled by a record of a baby because it's too low fidelity. And that's an interesting change that humans have had over the last century is that we've gotten better at, at telling the resolution of a sound and whether or not it's realistic. And that's an interesting addition to sort of the human lexicon of, of uh, sound awareness. Um, so best uses for audio modalities, it's good for visceral, reaction, visceral reactions. If you want to scare someone, if you want to make sure they pay attention, if you want to let them know that they're about to go into battle and that, like the bad guy is over the hill, you can change the music to match that. Um, it's great to get users looking at a specific thing. I think sound in sound design, uh, especially in virtual reality, is underutilized to get people looking where they want. Um, 
My friends who are game designers complain and say this doesn't necessarily work, but I think they're just not being extreme enough. If you really have someone saying, hey you, hey you, for like for, you know, eventually, or turn around and look in the right spot. Um, it's great when people are constrained visually. If I need to be looking over here and you need to be telling me something anyway, obviously you want to use sound for that. And it's great for ambient confirmation. And this ties into one more thing that's interesting about sound. I was saying we're improving and expanding the lexicon of sound, but we're also just really expanding the language of what sound means. Like I know if you get a text message and you know if I get a text message because we probably memorize the five most common you know, iPhone and Android text message noises. If you get a Slack notification, if you get a Facebook notification, when Netflix starts and it goes dun dun, you know. Like we are, is that HBO? No, that's Netflix. That's Netflix. What's HBO? <laughs> <laughs> Not as good at it, right? But well, anyway, the point is we have like a whole bunch of new hu human sounds that we have memorized again over even the last decade or so that mean a lot. And of course we always had the ability to, to differentiate between like the sound of bells, the sound of a wheels, the sound of someone else's voice. But it, this is a whole bunch of new little beepy sounds that we have very like, quickly scaled up with and we know what they mean. And we all know what they mean in this room. And again, that's just an interesting quirk of hu human brain plasticity. Okay, um, I didn't have a lot of customized sound examples uh, other than the alarm beeping to confirm that it was gonna let me sleep longer. Um, and this was in part because a lot of the audio that I talked about for my morning um, was kind of inferred by default. It was working, I knew that if when I laid out my yoga mat, oh, I'm not sure I even mentioned this, but when I, when I laid out my yoga mat, I wanted the meditation to start playing, right? So if it starts playing, I know it's working. I don't really need a beep or confirmation for that. Um, I would say today voice assistants talk way too much um, because they're often repeating the task back to you to confirm. That's because they're trying to learn and get more data back. Um, the better way to do this really would be for them to have a quick visual confirmation and just a quick beep to let you know that they've got it. So for example, today, uh, if I say, hey, hey Siri, don't pay attention to me. <laughs> set an alarm, it'll, it'll say, okay, I've set an alarm for blah, blah, blah. I don't really need that. You know, It'd be better to just have a quick visual or a thumbs up or something in the corner of my glasses and then a small beep. That's basically all I really need. Um, okay, so here's a real life example of when audio is the best um, in a surgery room because the surgeon can't really look anywhere else and they can't really use their hands to do anything. So if you've ever seen you know, a TV show of a surgery, you'll see that they're constantly talking to each other. Interestingly enough, I was just listening to a podcast about um, uh, was listening to a recording of when a flight almost crashed in Iowa in the 90s and they were, uh, had a recording of the black box and it turns out that human communication, in this case everyone was desperately trying to keep this plane from crashing where the engine had gone out, and human communication levels went up to like 200 words a minute back and forth and it's constant reinforcement of like, do you have this? Yes, I have this. Do you have this? Do you have, yes, I have this. Constant bids um, and confirmation. So especially in a surgery room are the places where you're distracted and you need to achieve a goal together, uh, audio is king. Um, all right, that's, that's about enough about that. Okay, finally, physical modalities. Well, not finally, but of the big three, the finally. Um, it's actually the slowest of the bunch. By the way, um, someone asked me to cite my sources for rewards per minute. I think I got all of these off of Wikipedia. Uh, it can be very fast and it can be very precise depending on what it is that you are doing. And it's, that's more for an input than it is for the computer's output back to you. So you can be very precise at typing. You can be very precise at playing a video game depending on how good you are at it already. Um, the main thing about physical modalities, especially as input, is that they allow the user to bypass um, the knee, the, is it the neofrontal cortex? I'm saying it wrong. Okay, all right. It allows you to bypass the higher parts of the brain. It allows you to get in the flow. And this is really where a lot of the magic happens around human communication and human creation. So if you want to get to a state where your user can do something without having to think about it, you need to have some sort of physical input. Uh, you can kind of do this with voice a bit, like you can just sort of talk 
and definitely people can sort of do this with singing, but for, mo for most of humanity, if they're trying to create something that isn't just sort of a, a natural human expression, um, having a physical modality is key. In terms of feedback on the other side, when computers are talking back to, com to humans, uh, haptics, for example, are a great way for you to feel like something is truly real. We've used this in video games for a long time. We use this for virtual reality. And I would argue, too, um, especially for augmented and mixed reality, when you are looking at something that feels fairly real and is kind of there in the space, if you have uh, actual haptic feedback when you start to collide with, with, the, um, with the digital object, it really just lends an intense realness there to, that you would not get otherwise. Um, how many of you have played the Porgs game for Magic Leap? Anybody? All right. I, there's a magic leap, like in the other room, because I was just using it. And you should all go play the Star Wars Porgs game, because they are so cute. It's a, and it's also just a great example of like having a real life, you know, science fiction character running around your space. It's awesome. But they do a good job with the haptic feedback specifically. So don't play it because it's fun. Play it because it helps you learn about best practices. That's a reason, right? OK, cons of physical modalities, obviously, they can be tiring much more tiring than almost anything else. Um, physical hardware, I think this is actually why um, we all have, now have these like glass tablets that we use as our primary computing devices, like this big or this big, right? Because it's harder to make and it's easier to break, basically. If you have something that has a bunch of springs and wires and you know, plastic, it's, it's harder to use. I think that's why Apple actually got rid of all of their buttons. I don't like them for it, but I, I get the point. Um, I wrote this before, much higher cognitive load during the teaching phase. I think now that this is a lie. I don't think physical inputs are any harder than any other type of input. I think we just think about it more because we encounter them more. So for example, is it harder for you to learn how to finger paint than it is for you to learn how to talk? Toddlers would argue no, like they're about the same. And we know now too that you can actually teach your toddler sign language before the vocal cords are formed and they will be able to talk at you. So I do not think this is actually true. But throughout your life, we will probably come across more new physical interfaces that you need to learn. Like every time you play a video game, you have to learn new button mappings. Every time you buy a new video game console, you have to learn a new controller, right? So we, we see them more often and so we think that they're harder to use. But I think they aren't actually that much harder to use in the end. And once they're mastered, uh, you can do so much more with them. Um, they're less flexible, though. If I have a visual interface and I'm like Tony Stark and I'm moving around my entirely visual interface, I can move it anywhere I want to. If I have a real physical interface in the real world, I have to you know, put it on a table because physics. Um, and you do have to memorize more than you do in other interfaces. Like with visuals, I can have an OK button over here. I can have an OK button over here or wherever. And I'll just find the OK button and I'll hit it. But if I'm trying to be in flow and I'm trying to play the piano, or I'm trying to play a video game, what have you, um, it needs to be in the same place consistently or otherwise it will break that flow. OK, so best, best use cases, I've said this quite a few times now, flow states, um, situations where you can't look at the UI. So for example, when I'm typing, I don't want to look at the keyboard. I want to look at the screen. So therefore, if I, if I had a digital keyboard, with no haptic feedback and no sense of where my, no affordances for where my fingers are, I will be constantly looking at my fingers instead of at the screen, which is a bad situation. Um, and where mastery is ideal or essential. So if you want to be able to do something really quickly, then you're going to want physical modalities. Um, I don't have a lot of physical stuff here uh, in my example of the spatial computing morning because I was never in a flow state. I was always kind of doing something else. So I didn't really think it was that important. That being said, I think for this particular interface, it's designed to be touched, so at least I can be hitting something on the table. And I don't have it all floating you know, a couple inches off the desk. So I can at least really rest my forearms, which is a key concern for uh, making sure things are comfortable. Um, this is a real world example. Instruments are obviously the big one. I think probably the biggest of all. There's a lot of tools um, that you could use. Car for example, but instruments are interesting in that they are, have a combination of modalities because you press a key and you get back a note. Um, and also because people really just get it. 
it's, it's, it's always very curious to me how much people can memorize the sheer physicality of a physical input and then kind of just keep that in their brain memorized, even though human proprioception is so bad, there's no way he's doing that anywhere near what he needs if he was actually hitting the keys. But we still have the memorization there. <coughs> and actually, that brings me to something else. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, actually. By the way, anyone recognize this? No? It's concept art from Ghost in the Shell. I really like uh This gets me to one more thing. Sorry I'm skipping all over the place, but uh, this is an interesting crowd, actually. So I think you we're going to pick and choose from all these different things. I want to talk about brain modalities for a second. Um, I just tried one that really got me thinking. How many of you have tried something that, that work like VCI, brain control interfaces, OK, EEG stuff? How well did it work? Yeah. Terrible. I mean, terrible, terrible, terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but this is close to the Ryota dream of what we actually want, right? Where I think a thing, and then that thing happens. So there's, there's a combination of ways that we can, we can uh, do this. It can be neural inputs, uh, reading energy signals. I don't know how many of you saw the alter ego, but it also, um, it also reads your, uh, your bone uh, vibrations. And there's, any, there's a host of other things that you could be measuring. Um, these are examples of, of each of those. Up here, this is a BCI um, examples. Down here, this is the alter ego. So it's not only reading um, electric signals, but then also the, the bone vibration along the jaw so it can read uh, subliminal, uh, subliminal vocalizations. And this is an interface that I tried the other day on um, the control labs. Um, I don't know, it's kind of an armband, I guess. And it allows you to uh, do really good, precise hand tracking, but then also kind of thought-based movements. I want to talk about this because I had an idea in my head of what that would feel like, and it turned out to be inaccurate, and I think it's interesting. One of the examples for, for control labs um, had you just picking up something and then pulling it and using your fingers to do different things with uh, objects, and that felt pretty good. It was like, cool, I'm going to grab the cup, I'm going to bring the cup back to me. This is a classic Yoda pose, or, or Emperor pose, whichever you choose, whichever side you choose to be on. Um, and then, you know, if I hit the middle finger, it would rotate. If I hit this finger, it would scale, et cetera. And I thought that actually was a great way to use your thumb actually becomes a button press, which is nice. Because just doing this actually doesn't feel very good, but if you've got something against which to press, it feels a little bit better. But then they had me try another example, which was a running game uh, where I was controlling a little T-Rex that would jump up and down. And they had me calibrate for a little bit and move my finger. So the idea is I would move my finger, and then the T-Rex would jump right when I moved my finger. And the idea was I would stop moving my finger and start thinking about moving my finger eventually. And they had me practice for a little bit. This sounds correct, right? Like if I'm imagining like playing Super Mario Brothers, and I'm just like, doing, doing. You know, like this sounds like a thing that would make sense and would be an interface that, that would almost be um, uh, intuitive. And I don't think any interface is intuitive, so I don't use that word that lightly. But the reality is this. My brain actually creates neuron firings that I don't in interact on all the time. And a lot of those are, f are false, or a lot of those are not things that should happen. So I was looking at the little dinosaur, and I was looking at the tree, and I was like, don't jump. And guess what happened? It would jump. And so <laughs> this is really just like a week ago, and I was like, well, shit. I was very excited about that, and now I don't know how I feel about it. And it's interesting to think that even if we get to a point where we truly can have interfaces that can read our minds, we might not want them to do anything about it. The level of calibration there is intense. The guy who showed me the demo had really trained himself to do it correctly, where he could really kind of think, and he could get the dinosaur to jump exactly when he wanted to. And he'd probably been working with it for three months. So it's not that it can't be done. The point is just this. If you're starting to think about how intuitive things will be in a future when the computer can really read your mind and do what you want, it turns out that your mind is saying a lot more things than you might have been expecting, and you're going to have to train it to not do that. Everybody see Captain Marvel? 
Yeah, okay, if you come on, it's like the best one in the whole MCU. <laughs> I highly recommend it. And there's a lot of movies like this where it's like, you have great power. You must learn to control your power. <laughs> well, I didn't really think that would be applying to like a neural you know, band, but it, I, guess it, I guess it will be. And we're going to have to be calibrating ourselves as well as the computers, even when we've really nailed uh, the, the whole interaction paradigm itself. All right, that's enough about that. I'm going to go back up a little bit. Um, any questions, by the way, I guess, uh, before I keep going? Yeah. Um, in your example of the morning routine thing, mm -hmm. uh, all the interface elements were mapped to physical locations. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were these flat panels of those different yeah, areas. Have you considered, or what's your opinion on interfaces that are mapped to your body in different ways, like on your hands or organized in different spaces things that you can access in different ways and, and interacting with three-dimensional holograms in the space in front of you. Like, just, yeah. Yes, totally have. Um, unfortunately, I don't have uh, I wish I had a visual example, but I'll, I can just act it out for you. OK, yes, having interfaces that are tied to the body make a lot of sense in many, many circumstances. So there's a couple ways of doing it. Um, the first is that you can tie it directly to the HMD. Have you ever tried this before? It's terrible. You have to have ease. Like, if you just actually tie something directly to your head and you have no ease on it whatsoever, it turns out your brain thinks that there's something in your eye. And it like desperately is like, because the only thing, because it just doesn't happen in real life, nothing tracks your head so precisely, and it feels really bad. So what you have to do instead is have what we call like a lazy follow. You can use ease a couple of different ways. So you can either have it kind of within um, the user's field of view, and I want to qualify the field of view. There are, um, there's like basically three types of field of view. There's whatever the device has as the field of view, which you're limited to, obviously. And then there's the actual human field of view, which is like, you know, fairly large. Uh, well, we say it's fairly large. It's fairly, all you can see as a human. But then there's the actual, I would say, like attention field of view, which is what you're really processing at any given moment. And what you think you're processing is not necessarily what you're even processing. There's still a lot of splotchy bits in the brain, right? Um, so what we have it do depending on, on the interface, is come up. Uh, we have a very specific UI called Spatial UI. And this is just allows you to quickly switch between uh, different actions in Editor XR. So it comes up wherever you're looking. Because uh, so, we don't want you to be like, where did it go? Where did it go? It'll come up wherever you're looking. And then if you move like about 15 degrees, it'll kind of swoop back in. And if you go again, it'll kind of swoop back in. Right? Um, and then you move your hands to select whatever you want, and then it'll go away again. It's a very passive, transient interface. It comes up right away, but it goes away almost as quickly because it takes up almost the entire screen, so you can quickly sort through it. And the reason why we made it so large is so that you could have fairly large hand gestures that were pretty, still pretty precise, because you're going to be moving on your um, elbow for most of this interaction pattern. Uh, we did another app, a wireframe app for Magic Leap, that has two types of pinning. So when um, the Magic Leap has a really limited field of view. So if the controller is in the Magic Leap's field of view, we pin the UI to the controller itself. But the odds are you probably are not going to have the controller in the field of view just because it's so much smaller than your actual field of view. It's just statistically unlikely that the controller is in your field of view. So instead, when you call up the UI, it's pinned to the space. But if you bring your controller up, it'll pin back onto the controller. And then when your controller leaves the field of view, we just kind of pin it down back again to near wherever it was your controller left. And then it can kind of center over time. So a lot of different ways of doing that, basically. Um, we tried other types of UI, like the tool belt. Everybody likes the tool belt. The tool belt sucks. And the reason the tool belt sucks is because if you have a bunch of UI that you need, or sorry, actions in your app that you need to access very quickly, you do not want to have to depend on moving your neck down um, on this, this vertebrae continually. It's just, it's really tedious. Actually, that's a good sort of thing to remember in general when it comes to human interactions for spatial computing. You don't want to have to bend like here, this part of the neck. You want to kind of just keep it to like the jaw level here. 
Um, and also, if you have any sort of arm uh, base movements, you want to keep it around the elbow level, so keep it within this space. And don't force users to use the, um, the ball joint on the shoulder, because that's when it gets really tedious and heavy, and that's when it gets really uncomfortable. Um, but I want to talk about this, because it relates to uh, spatial pinning as well as other things. So we've come up with a different uh, spatial permissions and states and types. And this is uh, somewhat overlaps with much, much of the other work in the field that has come before. But it is part of the way we're thinking about it uh, to make it accessible for Unity developers and, and hopefully inform uh, how, how apps are used across the board. So spatial permissions. Um, in the future, when we all have persistently running computing sessions and all computers can know who you are and or maybe you have glasses on and or maybe you have brain implant, not it, I'm not going first, um, spatial permissions will become increasingly important. They are a little bit now, they will be much bigger, uh, but the reality is we'll, we'll start to live in a world in which walking through a doorway or walking from one space to another will have some significant ramifications about what you see next and how you see it next. So we've gone around trying to define at least like a basis for this. So public spaces are of course, um, you know, streets, parks, places where we can all convene together. Maybe they're government controlled, but largely um, these are sort of, you know, the open spaces of the world. Controlled spaces uh, tend to be privately owned, but open to the public at certain times, like shopping malls, uh, for example. And this has some interesting uh, questions, even more than public spaces, around who gets to dictate what you see and when and what types of things can they overwrite. Like if you have a graffiti app that changes every Microsoft logo into an Apple logo, do you still get to use it in the Apple store? Or sorry, in the Microsoft store or in the Apple store? Right, like who gets to control what at this point? This also um, leads into some interesting questions around what can you erase and when? Like let's say I want to have ad blockers on. Well, what's an ad? Like is a logo an ad? Again, when I walk into a mall, does that just get rid of every single logo? It's easy enough to say like, cool, we'll just use computer vision to get rid of all the things you don't want to see. But how far does that extend to what is a territory owned by someone else? Personal spaces. I think this one is going to be a little bit easier because I think this is how people think about space anyway today. We largely think about it as this is my space and I get to choose what pictures I put on the walls here and then this is everyone else's space and I, I don't get to make a lot of decisions about that. Um, but even so, when I walk into your house and you have a cool piece of sick digital art that you're going to want to show me, you have to, we're going to have to figure out a way for me to either see it by default, see it via a gesture, see it via we're already friends and it already knows who I am and it already knows my face. There's a lot of, a lot of questions around how we're going to show things to other people. And finally, uh, private information. And this is stuff that it isn't really tied to spatial computing. And this is, I think, what the privacy structure is aligned around today largely. I think that's a fair assessment. Um, certain things like this are pretty obvious. They're always going to belong to you. And I think Europe especially is making some great strides in making sure that your data belongs, belongs to you and, and you can do with it what you want to. Uh, that being said, when it comes to spatial permissions, there are certain things that will probably override even your own private permission set like emergency regulations, right, or health warnings, et cetera. Uh, oh, right, which is why I made this one. <laughs> I used to just reference that, and then I actually made a slide for it, but I forget about it. All right. Um, this, this has to be pretty flexible on a per object or maybe a per transaction basis, though, so, because while it's fine to have something like come up and block your, your vision because it's like a place you shouldn't go, like don't go into that mine, it's scary. It's different if you're driving a car and then you have a visual warning pop up. Obviously that's not cool, we can't do that. So we'll have to think about how things are shown on different displays. Yeah. great to leave a few minutes for uh, questions if you... Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Like yeah. yeah. Oh, I thought it was 3.30. Oh, 3.20, okay, all right. Uh, well, then I'll just very quickly go through social permissions. Just how do you show it to who, when? Um, input states, 
Um, example of a remote would be like the, the volume that I showed earlier. That's a subset of, a, of another state. Um, by the way, we'll get all these slides so you can think about this at your leisure. Point is, for all of these different types of states per app, we're going to have to think about how they all work together and then across different multiple concurrently running apps that are shared in multiple space and how multiple users, how do those work together? Um, and just for something as simple as this, I won't go through all of it, you have to think about uh, if others can see it, use it when they're in the home, outside of the home, if they can see it but not use it, is there a larger version of it, is it anchored to my HMD if I move out of the space, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just for that one little piece of visual UI that I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, I didn't even go over this whole section, but computers need a human more and better in order for any of this to work effectively. And by human, I mean be able to listen to you, be able to be customized to you, and be able to take in all of these types of inputs and work naturally with you. Um, spoiler alert, this is not how computers are designed to work at all today. So we're going to need to start rethinking the whole thing. Um, but I think it's definitely going to work, because we're all thinking about it right now. We can all make computers better to have the special computing future that we all want. All right, thanks very much. So uh, I love your talk. Um, I like that I have faith in us. To some degree, I feel like we are kind of us, like we're all interested in this type of stuff. I'm curious, uh, who do you see as like kind of the main people in your community doing this kind of design work and thinking about what this type of spatial computing mixed reality systems is going to be like who are those people and who should we look to? I think uh, many of the Holland are both actually doing a really excellent job about thinking about this really thoughtfully and I also think that OpenX our community is doing a great job of thinking about this. I think the WebXR people are also doing a fantastic job of especially bringing a lot of the privacy problems to the forum. In part I think because they um, went through all of the privacy debacles of the past and they're really keenly aware of how important that is. I tend to be very much like, I don't care about your data and your privacy, give it to us so we can train up machine learning agents more effectively, but I'm glad that they're thinking about it. Yeah, so your um, morning routine mm -hmm. kind of reminded me a little bit of the vision of Ubiquitous computing that Mark Weiser wrote many years ago. But one of the things that I realized is that to some extent, you mentioned this, that you, you, you want communication with the computer to be better in some form of, mm -hmm. think about the modalities. But I did wonder in some of the examples whether communication was needed at all, like with the coffee, like you could imagine in 10 years from now that the coffee will be ready when you need it. Yep. Because it senses your heart rate, when you walk up, the same with the like snoozing of the alarm that you don't need to interact with the computer at all, it just knows your heart rate and so on. And so it made me wonder like, have you thought about like different tasks or for which connection with the computer is mandatory and others for which you could assume that computing is more of a, uh, like the infrastructure behind the scenes. Like we don't really think about like what's going on to power these lights, they just happen somehow. Um, and so you just think about the tasks and the ubiquitousness. Totally, totally. I think um, I skipped this whole section. There's a lot more slides here, so I apologize that I went off at length about other stuff, apparently. Uh, one key thing is that everything that you just described, a human needs to tell a computer, I don't care. Or it has to tell the computer, do this, do this, do this, do that. I often talk, talk about this um, in, as, as we need to be able to tell the computer no. Now, I can't tell my computer no today for much of anything. It, it you know starts up a browser. I'm like, ugh, no, you know, like I can say quit, but I can't say quit and learn and remember this next time, right? Like a puppy, I can't train it because computer uh, operating systems are not designed to listen to me, and in any case, they have no custom ability. So when you say the computer sh or the coffee maker should just know, it absolutely should, but it will would take a, at least three times of me saying, no, not like that no, not like that, yes, like this, or having some setup process, that can be refined over time because I don't know what I want until they do it wrong, <laughs> basically. Um, so yeah, well, as soon as operating systems on a base level have a, like a constant listener happening all the time, which means we have the processing power to take in that type of data, and we build the operating system and all the apps in it such that they can actually react to what the user is telling them, um, it's not going to be intuitive. We really need to get to a point where users are very used to talking to their computers about what they want and having the computer be able to respond. And that's no small feat at all. Machine learning. Um, 
Um, I'm curious, you talk a lot about uh, the different ways that, that we might leverage these systems, the different ways we might interact with them. Um, a lot of uh, the examples are, are very visual-centric or very audio-centric, and I'm just curious where you see us going in terms of accessibility mm -hmm. and the ways that we're going to evolve that as well. Mm -hmm. I don't like talking about accessibility as a broad swath statement because very few disabilities, there's no disability that's like, this is the disability and everything else is a subset. Maybe color blindness is the most ubiquitous of the bunch, but it requires kind of the least amount of effort compared to others. Um, one nice thing, I didn't go over the modality flow, um, but I do have like a, a graph, actually I guess I can bring it up very quickly, that just kind of talks about when you're gonna need to do uh, what you do when. Um, and this is like, when do I have the affordance? And then what is the input? And then what is the feedback mechanism? And this is a typical loop just for a game where you're saying, push the button, mostly visual. Push the button, you push it. That's mostly physical. And then the feedback is mostly visual and physical. But you can use this loop for any given thing. So you could literally say, OK, what is this like for a blind person? And then you will have no visual whatsoever, right? So then it's a lot heavier on the, the physical uh, haptic for, for as, a, as an affordance and so on, right? So I, again, like I, for in terms of accessibility, like there's no answer. Like, are, do you only have one arm? Are, are you hard of hearing? Are you completely deaf? Like, I, but I think um, as long as we start to be more thoughtful about what types of modalities you use when, that can easily translate to disability. And if our computers are listening to us and actually hear from us, then they can adapt more quickly. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting tie in with the last question as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I thought the um, spatial permission breakdown you described was pretty interesting. In terms of uh, personal spaces, have you thought at all about um, particularly multi-user settings, personal space in terms of like your body as it moves around the world, right? Like I'm thinking kids putting cookie note signs on their kids, that kind of thing, right? Like yeah. how you define it, how you control, like who can, who can access it, who can, yeah, who can see what, who can do what. Yeah, I mean, that, that first set around like physical, or sorry, um, uh, private versus public, I think is, you know, like if I walk, I, the uh, University of Washington is a state school, right? Um, okay, so, but if I go to a private school, you know, if I, the second I walk out the door and get on the street, then suddenly I'm in the city instead, right? So, it, uh, yes, and in terms of multi-user, I think, Having persistent sessions in the cloud helps out with things like the classic case of you're wearing Google glasses and I'm wearing Apple glasses. How do I show you map directions without it being just a clusterfuck, right? Um, if, if then, you know, like we both have access to the same browser, then we just render down a frame. You have the frame and then instantly I can render it via proximity or like gesture recognition or something like that. Uh, we just talked to a company recently, Verse. That, has, that is not thinking about it on an individual level, but it instead is thinking about all spaces as volumes. And then they simply have a permission set assigned to the volume. And then everyone who walks in or out is sort of judged by whether or not what they're allowed to do in that volume. So rather than tying permission sets to the individual, it's tied to the space, which is, I think, another interesting way of, of going about the problem. Yeah. So a lot of the kind of interfaces today of phones and laptops and whatever are kind of app based, you kind of have to move between apps constantly and mm -hmm. even if you're working on a document you have to kind of yep. switch between. Yep. Now obviously an entertainment kind of makes sense in spatial side of things to kind of take over the whole yep. scene. Do you see more of a move towards that kind of uh, document centric bring tools in from different things into the same space over right, time that's yeah. change or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that the like large scale productivity suites certainly have the best chance at doing that from the get go easily, right? Or maybe some of the open source alternatives can all kind of band together to come up with some protocol around being like, cool, I'm in Blender, but now I'm, you know, I'm moving back and forth very quickly. One interesting thing that um, I've noticed a lot is people who are trying to make applications in virtual and augmented reality now have to have pipelines that are set up much more like games or uh, movies because they need a 3D artist now, and they need a rigger and an animator, and so on. And they're really used to making custom pipelines that work between apps. 
So as we get more people who work in this very specialized space, working in this very sort of consumer grade space, I wonder if that's going to happen more naturally because people understand that it's important. But of course, I want to be able to like, you know, especially if I'm able to be in medium and sculpt something, I don't want to have to be like, now I'm going to open up Tavori and animate it. I want to just put it in Tavori on my Tavori space and animate it there. So, yeah. Just so that brings a question to my mind, which is, do you know anybody who's collecting these pipelines? Because no. <laughs> I wish I could say yes. That's really useful for those of us who are out trying to figure. Yeah. Similar to the question uh, in your community, um, who's doing a good job at some of these things, who in the kind of telecom has a seat at the table to really handle IoT, to handle 5G, you know, distributed computing? If I look at the lights, it knows that I want to adjust the lights just by looking at it, you know. Um, I mean, all the major telecom providers are going in, uh, in on edge. Qualcomm might be a major yeah, player here. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, so every, people uh, understand or know about edge computing, have heard about this before? Okay, right, so if you have local computing devices that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you wherever you are, and all the telecom services are now deciding to go in on that and stick a bunch of servers in their, in their towers, like any of them could, could be a clear player or a winner. So I don't really have an answer for you there. I just think like, well, we know who they are today. I don't know if they'll be the same people in 15 years. Uh, so the idea of special computing or the interruption seems to be like the, uh, like the XR, but uh, in terms of practical use, like uh, so uh, using your phone to viewing the same amount of messaging or using keyboard and mouse as input still seems more effective. Like, uh, no matter how far we can get in XR, like in like 30 years ago, we have uh, we have already get uh, voice input, but uh, still in today, people uh, still like nobody was uh, using voice input. Oh, so okay. do you think like the special uh, computing is more like an add-on ways of including instead of uh, like trying to uh, make some new ways to replace? Uh, I, I think that the keyboard and mouse are spatial computing in a way. Like, I mean, here I am in space interacting, right? I, I'm starting to define it more like literally having, it, it feels more, much more like the Internet of Things. That is more what the vision is, I think, for this. That I have any given device that understands who I am and what I want to do with it, and that I can move to another device or multiple devices. I think maybe we're just taking computing out of hardware limitations. So it can still be on a specific hardware with specific limitations, but it doesn't have to be. One of the examples we had of Unity in the future, it's still here. It's still like in a monitor space. This is actually pretty great because it's about the size of what you can grok in any case. Um, the difference is that it's 3D, and I could literally just put my hand in and grab something out. So that's what I mean by computing without the limitations of the hardware. So everything about what I'm doing, I'm still typing, and I still have a mouse. The only difference is, is I don't have a display anymore. But the rest of the computing experience is the same. Maybe it doesn't even need a name. Maybe we could just call it the future of computing. But I find having at least some term that gets the idea across is helpful. But I love keyboards and mice. I think they're fantastic. There's no better way to like literally move a single pixel on a screen right now today than a mouse. It still is the best way. I mean, it could get better, but. I mean, I mean comparing to if I can type in, I'm not going to speak in, and if I can just move my hand in my uh, touch screen, and I actually will leave and probably move things around. So it's just consuming more energy. It, it's more just more, like just slow than like, even touch screen. Well, think about it like this. How many monitors do you use? Monitor? Yeah, how many monitors? Like at your, your setup? One. One, OK. Um, do most people just use mon one monitor? No, two, some, three, OK, two. All right, OK. 
All right, so you just use one. I have one really big one, actually. I, I like having just one as well. But if you wanted to have three, or just one that is bigger, or one that is smaller, or one that is following you around, and have that all just be in your AR glasses, those are all just different permutations of this different hardware today, but it doesn't have to be tied to the hardware necessarily. Instead, whatever your computer wanted it to be, you could just have it look or feel like that. And I think although certain things might be slower, um, the overall advantage is that you just have a more customized computer experience that isn't tied to the limitations of the hardware. We have to, uh, we have to finish, unfortunately, but uh, feel free to ask questions after. Let's make it bigger.